My name is Asa Payne. After a lapse of 49 years, I again visited the Pea Ridge battlefield. Not the beardless boy who first came here, but an old gray-bearded man. I was surprised to find how little it had changed. What seemed to be the same old tavern with its elk horns was standing there still, but the barn was gone and in its place an apple orchard grew. There was nothing to remind me of treacherous days in March of 1862. I belong to the Confederate 1st Missouri Brigade, soon to be known through the South as the Fighting Missouri Brigade. Northwest Arkansas, 1862. 16,000 determined Confederates march on a collision course with destiny. Proud to be called rebels, they're from Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, Missouri, and the Indian Territory. Individually, their reasons for volunteering to fight are many and varied. Defense of home and hearth is a primary motivation. Many are willing to stake their lives on the belief that a state has the right to leave the Union if it disagrees with the national debate. For more than 80 years, that debate has swirled around the issue of slavery and whether it should be allowed to expand into new territories and states. 11 southern slaveholding states have seceded to form the Confederate States of America. But Missouri is a border slave state still in the Union, but divided within itself. Asa Payne and his comrades, under the command of Major General Sterling Price, were pushed out of Missouri by occupying federal troops. Now they have joined the Confederate Army of the West to fight their way back home. On the 4th of March, each man took three days' rations, one blanket, and 40 rounds of ammunition, and began to march to attack the Yankee General Curtis. The Yankee General is Brigadier General Samuel R. Curtis, a no-nonsense West Point graduate and a veteran of the Mexican War. Curtis's mission is to secure Missouri for the Union so that its occupying troops can be sent down the Mississippi River to split the Confederacy in half. Curtis's 10,000 federal troops are confident they have just chased the rebels out of Missouri. Proud to be called Yankees, most are farm boys from Missouri, Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana. Many are German immigrants and speak little English. Patriotism is a primary motivation for these young men. Many have staked their lives on the belief that the Union of States is unbreakable, no matter what the debate. Anything else is treason. The destiny of these two armies will be determined on a wide plateau in northwest Arkansas known as Pea Ridge. It is a rugged piece of land with dense underbrush, steep-sided ravines, and thick woods. Running across the Pea Ridge Plateau is Telegraph Road. Sitting astride the road is the Elkhorn Tavern, one of the few homes on Pea Ridge. Perhaps the biggest enemy of both armies is not each other, but something more formidable. The weather. Hoping to catch the Confederates off guard, the Union command chooses to wage a winter campaign. 
the harsh weather brings driving snow and sub-freezing temperatures. In northwest Arkansas, there is no escape from winter's howling winds and piercing cold. I was so benumbed with cold that I could not cap my pistol, said one young Texan. I tried ever so hard to do so, but had my life depended on it, I could not have succeeded. March 6th, 1862. Curtis chooses his ground. Outnumbered three to two, the Union Army digs in on bluffs above Little Sugar Creek, a small stream that runs along the south side of Pea Ridge. Lieutenant George Curry of Company C, 59th Illinois, labors with his men to prepare for a rebel attack. The first order was to build earthworks on this hillside and get artillery into position. It was a most tedious and difficult work. But that work is in vain. Major General Earl Van Dorn, commander of the Confederate Army of the West, makes a bold decision. Under cover of night, Van Dorn hopes to surprise Curtis by moving his entire army to a position behind the Federal lines. It is a move Van Dorn believes will bring a quick victory. A vain graduate of West Point, Van Dorn is flamboyant, brave to a fault, and full of dreams of glory. For Van Dorn, speed is of the essence. He leaves his wagons behind with blankets, food, tents, and most importantly, reserve ammunition. By this night of March 6, he has pushed his men to the brink of exhaustion. Private Ephraim Anderson is a volunteer from Missouri. Our movement was rapid. Some of the men remarking that Van Dorn had forgotten he was riding and we were walking. So hard were the men pressed that some fainted and fell in ranks, completely broke down. Van Dorn orders his men up a road known locally as the Bentonville Detour. It passes far behind the Union line and connects with Telegraph Road north of Elkhorn Tavern. Through the night and into the early hours of March 7th, Van Dorn marches his entire Army of the West around the entrenched Union Army, unseen and undetected. March 7, 1862 dawns cold and clear on the Pea Ridge Plateau. As Lieutenant George Curry's soldiers warm themselves with hot coffee, a courier delivers startling news. Van Dorn has succeeded. Sergeant, have him take arm. How had the enemy reached our rear? Had we not worked all night to receive them with our artillery as they approached our front, they had frustrated all our plans. Van Dorn's plan is to attack the Union rear from the Elkhorn Tavern. But on the morning of March 7th, weary soldiers from Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana, under the command of General Ben McCullough, are still miles away from the rest of Van Dorn's troops. Van Dorn orders McCullough to approach the Elkhorn Tavern from the west, a route that takes them perilously close to Union lines. A former Texas Ranger, McCullough doubts Van Dorn's tactics, but follows orders. Private Will Tunnard of the 3rd Louisiana remembers McCullough's words from the night before. As to the approaching battle, he proclaimed, 
I tell you, men, the army that is defeated in this fight will get a hell of a whipping. McCullough does not realize that a small federal force lurks in the woods, determined to stop his advance. Outnumbered 10 to 1, the Union soldiers from the 1st Missouri Artillery, 3rd Iowa Cavalry, and 1st Missouri Cavalry surprise McCullough's men. McCullough unleashes a thunderous cavalry charge led by General James McIntosh. Arkansas and Texas troops, supported by the 1st and 2nd Cherokee Mounted Rifles, ride roughshod over the Federals. For young Henry Dysart, a Union soldier from Iowa, the Confederate attack is his first taste of combat. Officers tried to rally the men, but order gave way to confusion. Bullets whizzed by my head like bees. I escaped back to camp. Outmanned, outgunned, and overwhelmed, the federal troops break ranks and run for their lives. In June of 1861 at Bull Run, Union troops also retreated in panic. Nine months later, with the embarrassment of Bull Run fresh in their minds, a small group of Union soldiers decide not to run, but to fight. Near a tiny hamlet called Lee Town, two batteries with the 12th Missouri, 22nd Indiana, and 36th Illinois make a stand. General McCullough makes plans to destroy the tiny Union force. In one hour, they will be ours, he says. Wearing his distinctive black velvet suit, McCullough decides to personally scout the Union positions. He tells his staff to remain behind. McCullough is unaware that he is riding into the sights of the 36th Illinois. McCullough lies dead, a musket ball piercing his heart. Moments later, the next in command, General James McIntosh, is also killed by Union troops. No senior officer remains to give the overall order to advance. The impact of McCullough's and McIntosh's deaths is enormous. Fully half of Van Dorn's army will remain idle here the rest of the day, waiting for orders which never come. At the base of Elkhorn Mountain lies Morgan's Woods, a tangled mass of underbrush and trees. General Samuel Curtis, the Union commander, has sent outnumbered Indiana and Illinois infantry into the woods to stall the rebel advance. A short distance away, Will Tunnard and his comrades in the 3rd Louisiana wait anxiously for orders. They can hear the sound of distant fighting. Their commander, Colonel Louis Hebert, mistakenly thinks this is McCullough's attack, so he orders the advance. Will Tunnard and his comrades slowly push forward toward an unseen enemy. As the line of battle cautiously felt its way through the dense undergrowth, the whole line was opened on with a fire so close and deadly that they wavered and staggered. For six hours, confused, vicious fighting turns Morgan's woods into a smoky vision of hell. 
Curtis sends more infantry to drive the rebels out. Amid the horrific chaos, Bear and his staff are cut off and captured. Thousands of Confederates are now without a leader on this first day of battle at Pea Ridge. With our forces in confusion, tired and worn down with their long marches, the order was given to fall back. As the day wears on, Lieutenant George Curry and his men push through Morgan's woods. At one place, we came upon two wounded men, all day uncared for. They made known their wants and piteous appeals not to bayonet them. Build a fire over here. They could not realize how we, who had faced them in mortal combat all day, would now stop to assist them. The valiant stand by Union infantry in Morgan's woods has far-reaching results. Van Dorn will receive no help from what is left of McCullough's wing. Two miles to the east, another battle is raging. Fire! Fire! It is at the Elkhorn Tavern, where the Battle of Pea Ridge will be decided. Van Dorn's plan is to take the Elkhorn Tavern. But to take the tavern means his men must scale the heights that rise above the steep wooded ravine known as Cross Timber Hollow. Curtis sends more troops past the tavern and down into the hollow. Union troops stall the rebel advance. Among the Union reinforcements is the 9th Iowa. And Private Vincent Holman, just 20. He keeps a daily journal for his sweetheart, Matilda Payton, who made him a warm vest, which only recently arrived. The Rebels' cannonballs began to fly like hail around our heads. We began to think we was going into action in good earnest. The rugged terrain has helped the outnumbered Federals slow Van Dorn's push up Telegraph Road. Fighting the steep incline and a hail of Union bullets, the 1st Missouri Brigade claws its way towards the Elkhorn Tavern. With them is young Asa Payne. We advanced in line of battle along each side of the gulch. I remember hearing zip, zip all around and could see dust flying out of the trees. The limbs and twigs seemed in commotion from concussion of the guns. Asa Payne and his Missouri comrades storm out of the hollow. At the head of the gulch, the Elkhorn Tavern and a large barn were in plain view. When we reached the top of the ridge, the Federal line fell back to the tavern and across a field beyond. And the enemy poured out of the brush onto us by the thousands. We held our own as long as we could. And then the order was to retreat. By the end of the battle's first day, Elkhorn Tavern lies in the hands of the exuberant rebels. Having pushed out the exhausted and outnumbered Federals, Van Dorn is content to stop and regroup. He is confident that tomorrow will bring complete victory. Through the cold, clear night, Curtis quietly shifts more troops toward the Elkhorn Tavern. Both Confederate and Union soldiers share the same experiences, aching for food and sleep searching for missing comrades, fearful about tomorrow. <laughs> Lieutenant George Curry. A full moon in a clear sky shed its beams directly on the upturned faces of the dead, rendering them still more ghastly and making their gray clothes almost white in the moonlight. 
To those soldiers, weary, chilled, and despondent, moonbeams never made a scene more cold or cruel. Beneath that same moon, the ghastly scenes leave an indelible impression on Ephraim Anderson, a young rebel fresh out of Missouri and far from home. The moon was shining, and her pale light reflected from the white flint rocks showed distinctly the stains and pools of blood. In places, the surface was sprinkled over with blood. The wounded had been removed, and the dead were lying in every attitude. The stillness of the night is pierced only by the cries of the wounded. It's OK, soldier. It's OK. Having spent the entire day in the cramped cellar, Lucinda and Joseph Cox now help with the injured soldiers. Their home, the Elkhorn Tavern, is transformed into a makeshift hospital. It is full of shattered men. Oh, fractured ribs. A mini ball in there. Painkillers like morphine and opium are running low. Chloroform and sponge. Sterilization has yet to be invented. The men are lucky if doctors wash their hands between operations, usually to amputate limbs. The soft lead bullets of the times shatter bone and leave little choice. The smell is sickening. One soldier at Pea Ridge remarked that there is no more agonizing a place during battle than a field hospital. Next patient. <coughs> Dawn, March 8th, 1862. Waves of blue uniforms move to the front as Union General Samuel Curtis masses his entire army for a bold counterstroke. In a crucial move, he places 21 of his remaining cannon on a high piece of ground known today as Wellfleet's Knoll. Ready? It is a strategy that will turn the tide of the battle at Pea Ridge. Fire! 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 The fierce cannonade is the most intense artillery bombardment yet seen in the war. Fire! With deadly precision, the Union artillery pounds the rebels. It was a continual thunder, wrote an Iowan. A fellow might have believed that the day of judgment had come. Asa Payne and his comrades at the Elkhorn Tavern are overwhelmed by the federal firepower. The bark and dirt was flying off the trees all around, and the cannonballs and grape shot and mini balls sang like hummingbirds and bees. At the end of the first day of battle, Van Dorn was confident complete victory was at hand. Now, some 18 hours later, the Union's crushing artillery barrage and infantry assault drive the Confederates from the field. The rebels feel cheated and betrayed by their commander. In his crusade for glory, Van Dorn committed an unforgivable tactical error. Supply wagons containing reserve ammunition were left far behind two days before. His men have little left with which to fight. None of them know it yet, but they had been part of the largest Confederate army that would ever be raised west of the Mississippi, only to fail. Curtis knows that the Battle of Pea Ridge has been won. 
Missouri is now secure. The balance of power in the West has shifted to the Union. And yet, the cost of victory is staggering. More than 1,100 Union soldiers have been killed or wounded. Confederate casualties are even greater. Over 2,000 rebel soldiers are counted among the dead and wounded on the Pea Ridge battlefield. Private Vincent Holman survives the battle only to die in camp nine months later of jaundice. His sweetheart marries one of his comrades in the 9th Iowa. Lieutenant George Curry and Private Henry Dysart survive the war to leave accounts of the Battle of Pea Ridge, soldier stories of suffering, sacrifice, and victory. Scorned by his own troops, General Earl Van Dorn is never trusted again by the men under his command. He is killed by a jealous husband 14 months later. Will Tunnard and Ephraim Anderson survive the war to leave their accounts of the Battle of Pea Ridge. Soldier stories of suffering, sacrifice, and defeat. Young Asa Payne of the 1st Missouri Brigade comes through the war as well. Nearly 50 years later, he returns to Pea Ridge, the Elkhorn Tavern, and the echoes of a mighty conflict. Old Asa Payne remembers when the teenage mother of Francis Cox was serving water to the wounded the first time he had come here. He has returned to remember. Once an insignificant roadside inn, the Elkhorn Tavern now stands as a monument to the lives lost here in the turning point of the Civil War in the Trans-Mississippi West. While seated on its porch, beyond the eastern hills, the full moon rose like a copper disc and shed its light just as 50 years before over the bloody field. But all was quiet. The booming of cannon and the wails of the wounded were hushed forever. I was lulled to sleep by the tinkling of cowbells and was awakened only by the hoot of owls, which seemed to me were hooting their last long hoot in memory of the past.